This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Swiss Family Robinson by Johann David Wyss. Chapter 3 at break of day I was waked by the crowing of the cock. I summoned my wife to counsel, to consider on the business of the day. We agreed that our first duty was to seek for our shipmates, and to examine the country beyond the river before we came to any decisive resolution. My wife saw we could not all go on this expedition, and courageously agreed to remain with her three youngest sons, while Fritz, as the eldest and boldest, should accompany me. I begged her to prepare breakfast immediately, which she warned me would be scanty, as no soup was provided. I asked for Jack's lobster, but it was not to be found. Whilst my wife made the fire and put on the pot, I called the children, and asking Jack for the lobster, he brought it from a crevice in the rock where he had hidden it from the dogs, he said, who did not despise anything eatable. "'I am glad to see you profit by the misfortunes of others,' said I. And now will you give up that large claw that caught your leg, and which I promised you, to Fritz, as a provision for his journey? All were anxious to go on this journey, and leaped around me like little kids, but I told them we could not all go. They must remain with their mother, with Flora for a protector. Fritz and I would take Turk. With him and a loaded gun, I thought we should inspire respect. I then ordered Fritz to tie up Flora, and get the guns ready. Fritz blushed, and tried in vain to straighten his crooked gun. I let him go on for some time, and then allowed him to take another, for I saw he was penitent. The dogs, too, snarled, and would not let him approach them. He wept, and begged some biscuit from his mother, declaring he would give up his own breakfast to make his peace with the dogs. He fed them, caressed them, and seemed to ask pardon. The dog is always grateful. Flora soon licked his hands. Turk was more unrelenting, appearing to distrust him. "'Give him a claw of the lobster,' said Jack, "'for I make you a present of the whole for your journey.' "'Don't be too uneasy about them,' said Ernest. "'They will certainly meet with coconuts, as Robinson did. Very different food to your wretched lobster. Think of an almond as big as my head, with a large cup full of rich milk.' "'Pray, brother, bring me one if you find any,' said Francis. We began our preparation. We each took a game-bag and a hatchet. I gave Fritz a pair of pistols in addition to his gun, equipped myself in the same way, and took care to carry biscuit and a flask of fresh water. The lobster proved so hard at breakfast that the boys did not object to our carrying off the remainder, and though the flesh is coarse, it is very nutritious.' I proposed before we departed to have prayers, and my thoughtless Jack began to imitate the sound of church bells, ding-dong, to prayers, to prayers, ding-dong. I was really angry, and reproved him severely for jesting about sacred things. Then, kneeling down, I prayed God's blessing on our undertaking, and his pardon for us all, especially for him who had now so grievously sinned. Poor Jack came and kneeled by me, weeping and begging for forgiveness from me and from God. I embraced him, and enjoined him and his brothers to obey their mother. I then loaded the guns I left with them, and charged my wife to keep near the boat their best refuge. We took leave of our friends with many tears, as we did not know what dangers might assail us in an unknown region. But the murmur of the river, which we were now approaching, drowned the sound of their sobs, and we bent our thoughts on our journey. The bank of the river was so steep that we could only reach the bed at one little opening near the sea where we had procured our water. But here the opposite side was guarded by a ridge of lofty, perpendicular rocks. We were obliged to ascend the river to a place where it fell over some rocks, some fragments of which having fallen, made a sort of stepping-stones, which enabled us to cross with some hazard. We made our way with difficulty through the high grass withered by the sun, directing our course towards the sea, in hopes of discovering some traces of the boats or the crew. 
we had scarcely gone a hundred yards when we heard a loud noise and rustling in the grass which was as tall as we were we imagined we were pursued by some wild beast and i was gratified to observe the courage of fritz who instead of running away calmly turned round and presented its piece what was our joy when we discovered that the formidable enemy was only our faithful turk whom we had forgotten in our distress and our friends had doubtless dispatched him after us i applauded my son's presence of mind a rash act might have deprived us of this valuable friend we continued our way the sea lay to our left on our right at a short distance ran the chain of rocks which were continued from our landing place in a line parallel to the sea the summits clothed with verdure and various trees between the rocks and the sea several little woods extended even to the shore to which we kept as close as possible vainly looking out on land or sea for any trace of our crew fritz proposed to fire his gun as a signal to them if they should be near us but i reminded him that this signal might bring the savages round us instead of our friends he then inquired why we should search after these persons at all who so unfeelingly abandoned us on the wreck first said i we must not return evil for evil besides they may assist us or be in need of our assistance above all remember they could save nothing but themselves we have got many useful things which they have as much right to as we but we might be saving the lives of our cattle said he we should do our duty better by saving the life of a man answered i besides our cattle have food for some days and the sea is so calm there is no immediate danger we proceeded and entering a little wood that extended to the sea we rested in the shade near a clear stream and took some refreshment we were surrounded by unknown birds more remarkable for brilliant plumage than for the charm of their voice fritz thought he saw some monkeys among the leaves and turk began to be restless smelling about and barking very loud fritz was gazing up into the trees when he fell over a large round substance which he brought to me observing that it might be a bird's nest i thought it more likely to be a coconut the fibrous covering had reminded him of the description he had read of the nests of certain birds but on breaking the shell we found it was indeed a coconut but quite decayed and uneatable fritz was astonished where was the sweet milk that ernest had talked of i told him the milk was only in the half-ripe nuts that it thickened and hardened as the nut ripened becoming a kernel this nut had perished from remaining above ground if it had been in the earth it would have vegetated and burst the shell i advised my son to try if he could not find a perfect nut after some search we found one and sat down to eat it keeping our own provision for dinner the nut was somewhat rancid but we enjoyed it and then continued our journey we were some time before we got through the wood being frequently obliged to clear a road for ourselves through the entangled brushwood with our hatchets at last we entered the open plain again and had a clear view before us the forest still extended about a th stone's throw to our right and fritz who was always on the lookout for discoveries observed a remarkable tree here and there which he approached to examine and he soon called me to see this wonderful tree with wens growing on the trunk on coming up i was overjoyed to find this tree of which there were a great number it was the gourd tree which bears fruit on the trunk fritz asked if these were sponges i told him to bring me one and i would explain the mystery there's one said he very like a pumpkin only harder outside of this shell said i we can make plates dishes basins and flasks we call it the gourd tree Fritz leaped for joy. Now my dear mother will be able to serve her soup properly. I asked him if he knew why the tree bore the fruit on its trunk, or on the thick branches only. He immediately replied that the smaller branches would not bear the weight of the fruit. 
he asked me if this fruit was eatable. "'Harmless, I believe,' said I, "'but by no means delicate. Its great value to savage nations consists in the shell, which they use to contain their food, and drink, and even cook in it. Fritz could not comprehend how they could cook in the shell without burning it. I told him the shell was not placed on the fire, but being filled with cold water, and the fish or meat placed in it, red-hot stones are, by degrees, introduced into the water, till it attains sufficient heat to cook the food, without injuring the vessel. We then set about making our dishes and plates. I showed Fritz a better plan for dividing the gourd than with a knife. I tied a string tightly round the nut, struck it with the handle of my knife till an incision was made, then tightened it till the nut was separated into two equally sized bowls. Fritz had spoiled his gourd by cutting it irregularly with his knife. I advised him to try and make spoons of it, as it would not do for basins now. I told him I had learnt my plan from books of travels. It is the practice of the savages, who have no knives, to use a sort of string made from the bark of trees for this purpose. "'But how can they make bottles?' said he. "'That requires some preparation,' replied I. "'They tie a bandage round the young gourd near the stalk, so that the part at liberty expands in a round form, and the compressed part remains narrow. They then open the top and extract the contents by putting in pebbles and shaking it. By this means they have a complete bottle. We worked on. Fritz completed a dish and some plates to his great satisfaction. But we considered that, being so frail, we could not carry them with us. We therefore filled them with sand, that the sun might not warp them, and left them to dry till we returned. As we went on, Fritz amused himself with cutting spoons from the rind of the gourd, and I tried to do the same with the fragments of the coconut, but I must confess my performances were inferior to those I had seen in the museum in London, the work of the South Sea Islanders. We laughed at our spoons, which would have required mouths from ear to ear to eat with them. Fritz declared that the curve of the rind was the cause of that defect. If the spoons had been smaller, they would have been flat, and you might as well eat soup with an oyster-shell as with a shovel. While we talked, we did not neglect looking about for our lost companions, but in vain. At last we arrived at a place where a tongue of land ran to some distance into the sea, on which was an elevated spot favourable for observation. We attained the summit with great labour, and saw before us a magnificent prospect of land and water, but with all the aid our excellent telescope gave us we could in no direction discover any trace of man. Nature only appeared in her greatest beauty. The shore enclosed a large bay, which terminated on the other side in a promontory. The gentle rippling of the waves, the varied verdure of the woods, and the multitude of novelties around us would have filled us with delight, but for the painful recollection of those who, we now were compelled to believe, were buried beneath that glittering water. We did not feel less, however, the mercy of God, who had preserved us, and given us a home, with a prospect of subsistence and safety. We had not yet met with any dangerous animals, nor could we perceive any huts of savages. I remarked to my son that God seemed to have destined us to a solitary life in this rich country, unless some vessel should reach these shores. "'At his will be done,' added I. "'It must be for the best. Now let us return to that pretty wood to rest ourselves, and eat our dinner before we return.' We proceeded towards a pleasant wood of palm-trees, but before reaching it had to pass through an immense number of reeds which greatly obstructed our road. We were, moreover, fearful of treading on the deadly serpents who choose such retreats. We made Turk walk before us to give notice, and I cut a long thick cane as a weapon of defence. I was surprised to see a glutinous juice oozing from the end of the cut cane. I tasted it, 
and was convinced that we had met with a plantation of sugar-canes. I sucked more of it, and found myself singularly refreshed. I said nothing to Fritz, that he might have the pleasure of making the discovery himself. He was walking a few paces before me, and I called him to cut himself a cane like mine, which he did, and soon found out the riches it contained. He cried out in ecstasy, "'Oh, Papa, Papa, syrup of sugar-cane! Delicious! How delighted will dear Mama and my brothers be when I carry some to them!' He went on, sucking pieces of cane so greedily, that I checked him, recommending moderation. He was then content to take some pieces to regale himself, as he walked home, loading himself with a huge burden for his mother and brothers. We now entered the wood of palms to eat our dinner, when suddenly a number of monkeys, alarmed by our approach, and the barking of the dog, fled like lightning to the tops of the trees, and then grinned frightfully at us, with loud cries of defiance. As I saw the trees were cocoa palms, I hoped to obtain, by means of the monkeys, a supply of the nuts in the half-ripe state, when filled with milk. I held Fritz's arm, who was preparing to shoot at them, to his great vexation, as he was irritated against the poor monkeys for their derisive gestures. But I told him, though no patron of monkeys myself, I could not allow it. We had no right to kill any animal except in defence, or as a means of supporting life. Besides, the monkeys would be of more use to us living than dead, as I would show him. I began to throw stones at the monkeys, not being able, of course, to reach the place of their retreat, and they, in their anger and in the spirit of imitation, gathered the nuts and hurled them on us in such quantities that we had some difficulty in escaping from them. We had soon a large stock of coconuts. Fritz enjoyed the success of the stratagem, and when the shower subsided he collected as many as he wished. We then sat down and tasted some of the milk through the three small holes which we opened with our knives. We then divided some with our hatchets, and quenched our thirst with a liquor, which is not, however, a very agreeable flavour. We liked best a sort of thick cream which adheres to the shells, from which we scraped it with our spoons, and mixing it with the juice of the sugar-cane we produced a delicious dish. Turk had the rest of the lobster, which we now despised with some biscuit. We then got up, I tied some nuts together by their stems, and threw them over my shoulder. Fritz took his bundle of canes, and we set out homewards. End of chapter